So we're going to try this again, and hey, it's actually really working fairly nicely. Hi there. Hi there. Okay. I'm Dylan. I'm Mike. And we're bros. Mm, totally. Bro fist. Do some like animation on there. What I don't know. Yep. Wonderful. So uh, welcome to the sort of beginning of a series of things that we've been already doing, except without video. Hooray. Um, where uh, Dylan, being the mastermind that he is, uh, asks me to ask him about a thing, a topic. So we did previously Hinduism, mm -hmm. and now we're going to do biology. So, uh, being that we're now actually successfully recording something... After or some great effort. We should start and then get through this before it decides to die on us and eat our homework. So, um, I was asked to come up with some questions to ask about biology, so I'm going to start by hopefully not giving a really long, protracted um, beginning to my first question. But it has to do with food, and there's um, a lot of paranoia. I, in the past decades, uh, I, Maybe it was an earlier thing, but um, at least since the 90s, I recall there being a very big um, push to organic and local and non-GMO, and all these things are now... Hmm? Hi there. Yes, I know. All these things <laughs> are common uh, vernacular. People understand these terms, whereas I think if you asked them in the 80s, they'd probably say, well, what's a snap bracelet? And that was a little bit later, though. But anyways, <laughs> um, just to start it off, uh, McDonald's in Canada ran a campaign where they would answer any question that you had about their food. And one of them uh, talked about their, uh, their bread products. And they were saying, uh, they were talking about beef, and they were talking about other things. You know, beef is 100% beef. Is that just the name of a company? No, here's how we make our beef. <laughs> Honestly, it's more cost-effective to do it that way. If you do a bunch of additives, it actually is very expensive. Um, getting the Basically, getting the cows in, making beef out of them, getting them out the door as fast as possible is a hell of a lot cheaper than adding things. So uh, somebody asked about bread products, and they said, what do you put in your bread? And they said, oh, well, we use all natural ingredients, this, this, and that. We also use... Um, Benzyl peroxide and um, some other kind of peroxide derivative and bleach. To me, right. Uh, to me, this didn't sound horrifying. Um, and they're like, oh, this kills people. If you drink oh, hydrogen peroxide, you die. Peroxide's bad. And look what it does to your body. It causes and, cancer. And they were pointing it, out it specifically... Does. Peroxide is, is banned in the European Union. You can't use peroxides. And I think, uh, more to the point, people don't understand how EU regulation works for uh, many food items and that it's not so much that something is banned, it's that um, there's kind of an established whitelist of things you are allowed to use. And, and for certain processes, um, you know, bread making being a fairly established thing that goes back and we kind of understand how, like, uh, uh, culturing and things like that work if you're going to make a sourdough or something like that. But um, we don't, uh, in the EU anyways, they don't uh, specifically ban peroxides. They're just not on the white list of things that you're allowed to use. Um, so anyways, my question was, um, can you give me, uh, first of all, an explanation of what would happen if I consume bread um, that had peroxide in it as... Uh, as Bleached versus unbleached flowers. It's not just used for the, for the coloration, as my understanding is uh, from reading some, some culinary sites. Bleaching isn't necessarily just coloration. Right, but it also has to do with changing the overall texture yeah. of the product that's created by the flower, so it's not just coloration. But yes, Bleaching, as in uh, oxidizing. Using a peroxide yes. to bleach a grain. But can you tell me what that really does to a grain? Uh, and then can you tell me what that, uh, what effect, if any, that might have in the body? Basically, uh, what is the body going to deal with mm -hmm. after consuming the good that ha was created with peroxide in the process of making the 
uh, flour or the, the dough itself. Okay. My, my understanding, actually, um, I, I should be more specific. They were stating that it was used in the making of the dough uh, and basically helping uh, more evenly, I guess so you don't have voids in the bread. You're not making a ciabatta. You're making something that's even. Okay. Uh, so when you put it in, in for dough making in that process, it um, I, I don't know what the technical term. It's not leavening. It's it might be leavening. It's something along those lines. Leavening is the creation of like gas in order to. Then it is. Then it is that. Yeah. Um, so could you tell me what the byproduct is in the bread, and then what the uh, what my body is dealing with, and and if there would be any uh, negative uh, aspects of that? Well, I don't specifically know this topic. Um, like verbatim. We never covered grain chemistry in biology, mm -hmm. and I don't particularly have a lot of food science background with baking bread. Mm -hmm. But I do know that reactive oxygen species, mm -hmm. especially peroxides, are linked to the creation of hazardous chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are to bleach your skin, for example, directly, if you have direct contact with high concentrations right. of hydrogen peroxide, those uh, HOOH mm -hmm. chemicals, you, you've seen the chemistry yes. for radical formation, Yep, uh, leads to the creation of two basically equivalent radicals with uh, a free, free orbital electron on one side and another free orbital on the other. And so these can propagate a uh, chain reaction of creating more radicals. And there is a lot of diet fad stuff where you are eliminating free radicals and using um, antioxidants to get rid of free radicals mm -hmm. and all these other things. And while that's a big fad, there are some parts of it that are valid. If you have um, cadmium in your diet, which is a bad thing, this uh, I would think basically most, most heavy metals would be a bad thing. In your <laughs> diet. Acts, acts as a similarly to a reactive oxygen species mm -hmm. um, because it has a lot of chemical reactive potential. Um, and so, when you have this um, in your food, you're um, being exposed to this in your uh, inner and you're basically the skin on the inside of you. Um, so even though it's not like direct skin contact, mm -hmm. if it's in your digestive tract, you're, it's going to come into contact with absorptive barriers. Right. Um, but and when it's used in the production process, I would imagine that it's reacting with the uh, whatever's in the the bread dough, mm -hmm. and uh, especially after the baking process, it's probably not really there in the form of a peroxide anymore. I guess that's what I'm getting at is saying that you have peroxide going into your bread in the bread making process doesn't mean you have peroxide coming out and going into your body. Certainly not as much as you put into it, but there yeah. it's it's likely that it's not a complete reaction. Hmm. Um I like I said I can't say that for sure. I would, I would have to look at mm -hmm. the process that they use to bleach buns <laughs> right. and McDonald's or in general what they use to bleach flowers um, and that would take a while to really research and, and okay. it's not like something that's widely researched either like uh, I don't think it would be easy to really find out how bad bleached flour is for you compared to unbleached flour I mean I personally prefer the flavor of unbleached flour when I'm baking my bread but well, at the same time, if you're making a cake, using unbleached flour doesn't really make sense because you can't end up with the same consistency with an unbleached flour. I mean, it's kind of the point. The, the point of making bleached flours was not appearance. It was really texture and making different sorts of goods. Kind of. You can, I mean, you can still sift unbleached flour to the same confectioner consistency. Right. But my understanding is, is, is gluten formation is entirely different between the two. So you end up with something that's, you're going to end up with something really tough if you're trying to use um, unbleached flour when you're making, let's say, you know, a confection, as opposed to if you're trying to make a bread. 
So that's my understanding. That's of it. possible. But I'm not sure. Like I said, I don't know a whole lot about. I guess the I guess I started out with a really fringe question. Th that is a really um, like if you're if you're talking about reactive oxygen species in mm -hmm. the formation of cancerous like tumors, that I can talk about. That's a lot easier. Yeah, but, but once again, that assumes that it's all directly exactly. present. Yeah, and that's. I guess that was the the. I was trying to go for the trick question, the the layman's assumption that what you put into something is necessarily what you get out which is almost inherently what chemistry tells you doesn't happen. Yeah, Ex except with radicals. They do mm -hmm. propagate radicals, usually. Radicals propagate radicals. Yeah, so well, the, the product side of radicals, unless you have a radical with a radical reacting, mm -hmm. they usually create another radical on the product side. Hmm. So the if you react an OH uh, dot radical with an OH dot radical, you get hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. If you react an OH dot or HO dot uh, with like glucose, you're gonna get uh, a broken glucose chain with a radical attached in like water, hmm. more or less. I, I've seen that reaction at one point. I don't remember the exact chemical structure, and I don't know exactly where it breaks it most frequently, but I do know that it creates uh, radical sugars. And I think it's more common with lipids, but that's that's from a long time ago, from stuff that was like in lectures okay. and not like from actual research studies. Okay. <sighs> so. So my guess is that yes, hippies that are angry about hydrogen peroxide and their brickers are overreacting, but in terms of using reactive oxygen species in food chemistry, it's something you should try to avoid in bulk quantities. I think it, w I think it would be safer to like use a bunch of stone ground flour for stuff, but that's not practical. Well, then you're going to wear away at people's teeth. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe we need more teeth grinding. Uh, who knows? I, I certainly could do with less of it, but that's just me. <laughs> um, so, I hope that answers your question yeah. at least partly. That is that is a a good a good partial answer. Um, obviously not as complete as I was hoping for, but that's definitely something. Yeah, I mean, I, I we could research it specifically, but I feel like you have more questions that are more answerable um, for me. Well. That was that was the one that I had really prepared that I really thought we could go a million places with. Oh, but, we, uh, we totally could. It yeah, it's just I don't want right. to spend too much time on one if you have others. I, I don't want to lead you down a dark alley then. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I guess I guess it'd be a good idea to stick with um, the the paranoias um, because this is I, I feel like the the utility of this could really be in debunking things. Misconceptions. Yep. Um, so I guess I should ask um, what about uh, the more paranoid news I hear about uh, is this going to be a problem if I keep on food science? No. Okay. I like food, clearly. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I just mean from a, a standpoint of getting good responses. I mean, I I have learned stuff about food chemistry before. What should I steer towards? Because I can come up with oh, a, a I question for anything. I really... The biology that I've specialized in is genetics, uh, morphology, mm -hmm. uh, cell and molecular biology, mm -hmm. so like small physiological processes, and instrument technology, so like using machinery and instruments in order to dis discover data that's otherwise hard to discover. Hmm. And let's that's that's really vague, and I've done a lot more than that. But let's jump into a, uh, a thing that you touched on recently. Um, you actually mentioned to me, and I'm going to mention a, a news story to you, because I love it when things just get completely uh, blown out of proportion. Somebody says, oh, yeah, I, I think we're uh, we're doing something that's sort of like this. And the journalist says, you mean from that one video game? And uh, this person, the researcher they're talking to, says, uh, well, I suppose you could liken it to that. And then you end up with a headline like this. Um, 
scientists are close to creating plasmids not unlike the ones in Bioshock. Oh, sweet Jesus. Uh, it was actually a headline I read that was something along those lines. Now, I, I'm guessing that whoever wrote that is very proud of themselves for getting a lot of ad revenue for their organization, and that's... I'm sure they are. That's a wonderful, great American thing that they've done. But um, what about the concept of... You were talking about genetic memory, actually. Oh. <laughs> it was specifically in regards to a recent Nature publication yep. uh, about the <sighs> transmission of scent memories uh, from generation to generation in mice. Uh, it was specifically in aversion to a certain induced fear uh, to a certain chemical. I can't remember the chemical. One of the most base responses of animals. Yes. If you uh, if you look at elephants, they happen to actually be afraid of mice. And it seems to be ubiquitous throughout all elephants, which is really strange. I don't know why. It just shows that they have really good eyesight. Oh, that's part of it. But um, there's... And a, apparently a very complex faculty for, among everything else that they do, identifying what a mouse is amongst everything else that they see. Yeah, elephants are pretty smart. That's well, uh, yeah. that's an aside. Um, basically, these, these mice are capable of uh, passing on a fear of a smell. And they recorded the responses in this nature publication, and they also had really excellent uh, photographs of the neural uh, glial development. I think it was the glioblastoma or something. I don't know. No, that's cancer. Uh, they just showed the nerve bundles in the olfactory bulb somewhere in their brain. It was really cool. So essentially a specialized portion of the brain to deal with scent. Yes, and it was and much more... And scent memory as well? Uh, or was that really a different portion of the brain? It was really cool. Uh, the specific method that they used was uh, a genetic mutant of this rat that they specifically developed in order to uh, study specific pathways mm -hmm. of thought. Um, they they made it so that the pathway that deals with this specific smell shows up with a fluorescent protein when it's expressed. I don't know how the heck they did it specifically, but it was a, it's a recent development in uh, cell biology techniques. So, so they could right. actually see the specific network that deals with that specific scent. Now, it's cool. I know we're going to be jumping off a little bit from... And I, cause I was going to try to center it more around a, a specific question... But um, let's go, before we go back to that, let's go into, uh, along the lines of what you were mentioning, there was another study where they were uh, basically just borrowing some portions of the human genome and stuffing them into mice. Yep. And suddenly... Glial cells. They're specifically the nerves. Ridiculously competent mice. Yeah. Uh, and I asked that, uh, obviously there's... There's reasons why different species are the way they are, and it has to do with their their environment that they existed in and being able to compete well for food against other species or what have you. Ad adaptation. Right? More or less? There's more, but... I, I, yeah. <laughs> but the conditions in which they live, their ability to thrive, and them being more likely to do that than other genetic variations of the same. Selection. Basically, yes. Okay. Um, so I thought, well, geez, if you can make these ridiculously intelligent mice, are they going to be more successful? And my immediate thought was, well, wait a minute. There has to be a cost for having a uh, developed brain like that. I mean, if you look at uh, cats are a really good example. Cats have giant huge eyes and a large portion of their brain is entirely about visual processing because that's what serves them well and that's how they survive. Mm -hmm. um, whereas dogs will have extremely large um, olfactory uh, 
just nerves upon nerves and a large portion of their brain de uh, uh, devoted to that, and that serves them well. Well, if you're going to have an, a highly developed brain, much like the cat, where um, most of its, uh, as I understand, I believe it's a majority of its blood flow within the skull is actually to the eyes and the uh, eye-serving portions of the brain because of the requirements, the actual like nutrient requirements. Yep, from the retina and yep. all that jazz. Um, so wouldn't it also be true that similar requirements uh, would exist for having a highly developed neural net, a highly developed uh, brain uh, as far as reasoning, as far as logic. And that was one that I posed to you, and I don't think that you necessarily had a response at the time, but I know that you were thinking about it when I asked that. So I was wondering if you'd thought about that one anymore. I don't remember you specifically <laughs> asking that question <laughs> when you did. I did. But I, I used the word um, I used the word biological upkeep. I, I, I believe to describe that. That but sounds slightly familiar, but yeah. but yes, th there are costs to every adaptive change. You've um, played uh, you played Spore. I have. Okay, so anyways. <laughs> It's a very. <laughs> it's not even. It's, it's nothing it's like. It's scraping evolution. the surface, but that's about all it's doing. Yeah, okay. It's fun. But, yep. Um, so, when you talk about having a more robust network of cells, uh, like adding the glial cells to rats' neural repertoire, basically, um, human glial cells, not just like rat glial mm -hmm. cells. I don't think they have glial cells, but I could be mistaken. Um, what's a, backing up, what's a glial cell, if you could define it? It's not like <laughs> myelin, it's... Uh, no, or, or it, it, myelin is a part of a nerve, so it's that fatty insulator, yes. like insulation on a yep. wire that allows it to do some fancy stuff. Well, it's not at all like insulation on a wire in that way, but it's essentially like it's, insulation it's on a wire if the insulation allowed the wire to be a superconductor. That's a closer description. Not quite superconductor. Right, but just more efficient. It just allows for a special, faster transduction of electronic potentials. Electronic mm -hmm. being ionic potentials, but yep. it's also electronic because of ion differences. Sorry, that's, again, an aside. Um, a glial cell is a helper cell, quote-unquote, to uh, normal... Uh, Dendritic cells, dendritic or finger cells, I think is the word for the normal ones mm -hmm. in nerves. Um, oh, no, that's just a region on a regular nerve cell. I don't, I don't know what the primary nerve cells are called for some reason. I'm just forgetting it. Um, but glial cells um, used to be thought to be pretty much useless, and um, within the past. 15 or 20 years, they started to elucidate the specific purposes of a lot of cells in the brain, and like mirror neurons, which is another really interesting topic. Um, and spindle neurons and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, glial cells, they found, I believe, are largely helping with nutrient spread um, and memory durability, I think. So like network durability. It's it's really complicated stuff that I can't really summarize in a sentence because it functions it's not like a diode system in the brain. It's not like one or zero for any like a given circuit. It's uh it depends on a lot of factors whether or not a signal passes through a certain branch. Mm -hmm. And I think the glial cell just adds a, a little bit more complexity to this circuit pathway. Hmm. Um, I always thought it was about quantities of, of neurons. So if you had more, more it's voting, more more voting more than yes than voting no, it would be a yes at some branch. It's more about morphology. I guess that would be called buckets, but in terms of, I'm trying to think of ways of describing it, a kind of like a logic circuit. That's interesting. I haven't fully investigated the parallels between logic circuits and neurons. I'm sure it's a great analogy. 
but I do know that for a signal to travel from one part of the brain to another part of the brain mm -hmm. and activate it, um, there's many different pathways of different lengths that can go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And depending on which um, paths it takes, and it could take multiple simultaneously, which is really cool, mm -hmm. it'll activate other secondary pathways as a result. And from what I gather, glial cells aid in keeping those connections robust through time. Okay. And you're saying that they don't normally exist in uh, <laughs> most... I, I would, well, let's just go with mice. I don't want to liken anything. I feel like they're better at their job in humans. I think is the best way for me to say it. Um, How does this tie back to genetic memory? Those are two separate studies, number one. Um, so we don't know. You, it's well, we it's hard to take a s one study and relate it to another study. Well, of course. Without explicit topic overlap. Um, but do we know how we how things physically express themselves with reference to genetic memory? Like, where is the first of all, where is the data stored, and second of all, how does it express itself? Oh, that that was something that the paper dealt with. Good. Uh, the first paper, not the, the right. glial cells from humans yep. being put into transgenic But there were glial mice. cells in the second one, or in the first paper as well. Yeah, more or less. I mean, it was a picture of the morphology of the olfactory bulb or whatever. Um, and it was about the the size and the, the quality of the, the, the neural network that was made there. But the... Uh, the the way that it was transmitted, they hypothesized, and they can't really say for sure right now, because they were just collecting data on, like, the breeding and the success of the, mm -hmm. the phenotype transmitting, rather than saying that, oh, for sure, this phenotype was caused by da 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 da, -da. They just gave suggestions for future research, because that's the way science works. Um, they suggested that the histone code is what gets modified during scent memory storage events. Um, and that the... the... the signal of this, uh, this scent response being repeated so many times created a uh, a permanent change in the the way that the DNA opens and closes for expression. So like when you have the DNA when it's like tightly packed and like uh, it's called a uh, it's called chromatin. It's the dense DNA. You can unwind it by putting, uh, well, by using a special protein called acetyltransferase and uh, putting special chemical groups on these proteins that wrap it and keep it wrapped, called histones, and it loosens and this allows other machinery to come in and actually, like, get some mRNA coded off of the DNA. And I think that if, if uh, like a fear hormone, or a fear response, or a distaste response, is um, is opened up enough, I guess that that makes it easier or tags it for opening in the future. So, I don't know specifically what signalers were tied to this particular chemical response, but apparently um, the, the signal to open that um, part of the genome up for coding opens it up in its descendants as well, because that histone code 
on the histones themselves was conserved, like when it passed on the next generation. And it, and it passed on even one more generation beyond that. So the first generation was the one that was conditioned for this scent fear. Mm -hmm. Second generation was absent to this stimulus, and so was the third generation, and both subsequent generations had this fear still. I don't know whether or not they did a third generation that wasn't in the paper. They it's a lengthy, lengthy study already, obviously. Yeah, well, um, it's expensive to do stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, the the important part is that they did the F2, the the second uh, familial generation, I think is what it, fraternal, I don't know. So, I guess the, the uh, takeaway from this is that there is likely a whole other level of genetic encoding going on. Oh, yeah. It's called the histone code, quote-unquote. Oh, great. Yeah, there's the Human Genome Project didn't do crap. <laughs> well, it did, but it... It's a starting point. It's a starting point, but it it's it conveys so little about the information for right. coding. Well, it makes good sense from the standpoint of the layman thinking that we have a extremely high similarity to monkeys. <laughs> and if you, for whatever reason, dislike that to the degree where you can't be bothered to notice that we have five fingers, five toes, two eyes, and a bunch of other things that are similar, then it, it's comforting to know that we have another thing now that we might want to look at. But it still doesn't explain, like, I guess a fear response is a very base thing. You said a distaste response, and that's another thing. That's actually an interesting thing that w that uh, that's brought up, because commonly you hear uh, people say things about, you know, oh, you know, a child, let's say, doesn't like whatever particular food. And then somebody remarks how somebody else in the family didn't. And that's not unlikely, first of all. Um, there's many things that children will be exposed to that they probably won't like, and, and it's fairly common for them not to like them. Um, but it brings up the possibility of that, you know, let's say great-grandmother just shoved the spinach down your throat and you have horrific nightmares about spinach, and suddenly generations beyond that the children just don't want to have anything to do with spinach could could be, be explained by this possibly possibly but at the very least uh, it's interesting to know that there is this other uh, encoding this other data storage uh, biological data storage going on oh there's more than that too it's not just the histone code it's so cool I was just trying to say that one thing was neat that people didn't necessarily know about. But yeah, there's a, a bunch of things. Yeah. Um, a lot goes into determining whether or not a certain protein is made from a certain gene. More than just the DNA. And more, more than, than just, just the, the, the nucleotide code and the histone code. A lot. Okay. That's cool. That's very complicated. Yeah. Oh, so I have another biology question for you. This one is also derived from the news. I'm trying to stay current on things. It's and these cool. are things that people are going to gloss over in the news and go, well, that's interesting. Well, I understood what it was. So the concept that you can now suddenly just make um, stem cells out of damn near anything. Blood cells. A uh, Chinese team actually recently discovered. By stressing them. And by stressing we acid mean stress. acid. Yep. Yep. Not like LSD. Not like, whoa, dude, the colors. <laughs> but uh, as in the opposite of a base. Yeah. So Hydrochloric, et cetera. Talk to me about that. It's cool. Uh, a little if, bit more if, detail. If you want to know, like, what is totopotency and what is a stem cell, It would be cetera. useful to know, um, am, am I just going to be able to replace my, my old man cells with, with uh, young baby cells? <laughs> I mean, come on. This uh, is, that's, I, I guess that's when most people think about stem cells. They think about embryonic stem cells. They think about, uh, you know, just recovery of organs or uh, major repair to the body. And I think it probably, I, I personally, not knowing a lot about this, but thinking about it, the one area where we always seem to have difficulty 
in the medical field anyways, is uh, with nerve damage and trying to get nerves to repair and rebuild. So stem cells, being very good at doing anything really, or falling into line with any particular uh, other group around them, um, might make a very fine replacement for damaged nerve cells. That was my thought. Is this something that's going to likely be useful in that sort of endeavor? Yes. Okay. Now, <laughs> um, stem <moving> cells. <laughs> <laughs> stem cells have a lot of potential and have already demonstrated a lot of potential in research. Mm -hmm. um, it's critically important for understanding cancer development. Period. Because the path from being a normal cell, a normal cell, to being a totipotent cell that can become anything, they say, uh, totipotent is all potential. Um, to becoming something that's bad, let's say, like a yeah. uh, rapidly dividing cell in your brain yeah. is bad. <laughs> well, it's really good because, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it doesn't require much food. It doesn't require uh, the removal of much waste. And it's replicating itself very fast, replacing any other useful cell around it with something that is really good at replacing itself very fast yeah. and not actually doing a job. If it were a separate organism from us, it would be doing its job very well, and it so would be very fit if in terms of evolution. If, if a cancer cell could be likened to... I, is it kind of like idiocracy, where oh God. it just breathes very fast, but it doesn't do anything? Cancer does a lot. Um... It doesn't really do anything good that I can think of as far as to us, but um, well, it does. I mean, it kills off. It kills us off when we're old, <laughs> when we're, you know, uh, when we are of lesser potential than when we are not. In this, that that's, that's more of that's more of like a bioethics question. It, it, um. yeah, I know that's a very that's a very thorny thing from bio bioethics standpoint. If, but if you think about it from the raw uh, statement that I made, like uh, let's say you didn't have the civilization around you, and you really just had did have the raw resources uh, for members of your tribe or your group or your uh, pack to survive long past the point where they are able to hunt and gather food and protect the others in the pack uh, would actually place you at a disadvantage. So... What would? Uh, if, if you were... Okay. Uh, the, the utility of an animal in terms of uh, a pack or social animal. The utility of that animal is in its ability to provide for itself, its pack, protect it, uh, you know, uh, fend off predators, uh, be a predator in the sense of collecting food or controlling territory for the pack in itself, right? More, if more or less, there's more to it than that. If if in old age you're not able to do those those jobs, uh, and essentially you're no longer furthering the goals of the pack, if there is another pack around that doesn't have those elderly, there stands to reason more likely to survive. Their food needs are lesser, uh, their defense needs are lesser, and they will probably take over a territory against a pack that, well, needs a higher upkeep. So, in, in that sense, I'm not saying that it's necessarily good, I'm not saying that it's necessarily ethical, and I'm certainly not saying that it has any bearing on current human society, but uh, with those regulations in place, uh, cancer might prove useful in killing off the uh, the ultra members. old, yeah. <laughs> that old, the elderly yeah. wolf. Um, I think that does have its place in the natural order of things, and I do think that cancer being so common in humans and animals is just a demonstration of how. Um, plastic organisms are and how 
subject to change they are genetically. <coughs> Fairly and predictable change, though. Uh, it's hard to predict, actually, but we're getting better at it as time goes on. Um, I, d I do think that um, it is important to have death in general. And I think that having an immortal society would probably have a lot of costs that would probably outweigh yeah. its benefits. Well, I think it would probably have a society, uh, resulting in a society where you couldn't have immortality anymore. Probably. It, it's not practical. Yeah. You, you I mean, I mean cellular immortality. I don't mean like persistent living, like forever. Ah, okay. Like when I say immortality, I mean like if you, for example, didn't age. Right. And the cancer was just like a risk to that. Like if you if you didn't get wrinkles, if you didn't right, if you didn't have your saying. metabolic processes degenerate over time, if your chromosomes didn't shorten on the ends as they do each time they replicate, etc., then you could live forever so long as you had enough nutrients and it didn't get shot. <laughs> Yes. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but adding to that, the, the process of uh, breeding makes the, well, other two things that you said, running out of food and getting shot, more likely. Yeah. Um, um, it can only support so much of a population. Yeah. So I think death has its place. Mm -hmm. um, and cancer, I don't want to say cancer is like good for stimulating death in old people. <laughs> well, it um, does. I mean, it does. It does kill old people very well in America. But, um... Well, I there's mean, a testament to the fact that we do a very good job uh, staving off other kinds of uh, fatal occurrences. Yeah. So it's, it's just what's left. Yeah. Well, we can't do much about that, so that happens. Yeah. Currently. So... Yeah, cancer is complicated. But you you were saying uh, cancer is closely related to uh, essentially plasticity uh, with regard to being able to coax cells into uh, totipotency. Pot to totipotency. And I'm just potency, using that yes. word no, it, as, it like makes sense. as another word for stem cell. It doesn't roll off the tongue nicely. But that's okay. I, I understand it. Stem cell has a lot of encouraging thoughts. But yeah, uh, um, getting a cell to become a stem cell, a, a, you know, a whatever cell, a skin cell, let's say, to become a stem cell. We can do that, and uh, not necessarily saying we could, but it stands to reason that that, that if there are um, reasons why a cell becomes a stem cell, it's probably reasons why and conditions that promote a cell becoming a cancer cell. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, of the ones that I know of, none of them are normally very good for the body. Um, it's pretty odd. Um, things that cause cancer are carcinogens. Yes. Period. Things that are just very bad to expose <laughs> the, any part of the body to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we are exposed to them just by virtue of existing. Yeah. So. Um, natural mutations as well can cause cancer, mm -hmm. like outside of carcinogens. Your own cellular machinery yeah. makes mistakes. Yep. That can cause cancer. Yep. Um, and that's all part of the the process that's built in, and I I don't imagine that it would be impossible for cells to work perfectly. They just don't. They shouldn't. Why don't they? Well, Probably because the upkeep costs of having a, per a perfect cellular system is ridiculous. Yeah, um, and and the accuracy of uh, replication for DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase mm -hmm. isn't 100 percent. This brings up an and interesting. That's, that's usually a good thing because it brings variety into the genome. This brings up an interesting question, uh, or not a question, but uh, an interesting point because there was um. Recently, uh, there have been uh, been a couple articles uh, going into the theory, theoreti uh, theoretical uh, world of creating processors uh, that would be, you know, your typical transistor-based processor, except 
um, not to and, and algorithms more specifically uh, for dealing with things like video data. Lots and lots of uh, actual bits of information and very complicated algorithms that they need to be passed through to, to push out a result that's usable. But the point is often made that uh, we, we saved a lot of uh, data through lossy encoding because the observer is not going to notice many of the things that are missing in a, a video or audio stream that is uh, where a lot of it, the data is thrown out that's extraneous that people aren't going to notice. That the same could actually be done for the algorithms and also the processors handling the, the, the ASICs, the specific, do you know what ASICs means? I know what ASCII characters are. No, uh, application specific integrated circuits. No. These are basically um, subparts of things like cell phone processors or to a lesser extent processors and general purpose computers that deal with certain things like uh, imagine you had an, a, a small portion of a processor that is set aside specifically de for dealing with MPEG-1 layer 3 audio or MP3s. You can just throw a bit stream at it and it will puke something out that works as PCM on compressed audio in two channels or whatever format it's, it's doing. Um, this is actually very similar to how if you think about portions of the brain are specialized to deal with certain things. Um, and then there's things like FPGAs, which are uh, field, programmable, field programmable gate arrays. <laughs> gate not, gate <laughs> ar not gate array, <laughs> gate arrays, uh, which are essentially reprogrammable processors that you can flash to kind of move. I imagine it's like a, like a maze, except where each junction, there are junctions in this that branch um, and so essentially it can behave like a processor, uh, a general purpose processor, except it can behave however you want it to. So you can, it's programmable hardware. Yes, so it works at hardware speed, but it's programmable, unlike That's most, super cool. most ASICs. It's very cool. But what I was getting at, what I was getting at was the concept that you could have good enough uh, algorithms <laughs> or algorithms that don't, they don't always, you put in the same information, the same exact information, you get out one result. You put the same information again, you get out a similar result. Not the same, not necessarily. The point is just that they come close enough to an approximation that the, uh, the, for the purposes of the output, it's good enough. Um, the theories behind this state that you could be saving orders of magnitude uh, worth of power because of not having to have as many transistors or not having to have as many cycles to do something. So the, uh, this actually seems kind of similar to what you were talking about um, where genetic machinery doesn't always come up with the same result. And the reasons could be multiple, if, and I'm trying to go with reasons, m avoiding the concept of a designer or something <laughs> like that. But I mean reasons as far as uh, as, as survivability and, uh, and evolutionary yeah. reasons. You don't necessarily need to live for 8,000 years. You don't necessarily need for every single one of your uh, genes to be, or, or every single one of your uh, uh, genes to be copied perfectly. There's no point to that. The thing that matters is does your, you know, from, from a, a standpoint of creatures on Earth, it survives for a time, it's able to produce offspring, it's able to thrive, and then it dies. So the utility in having perfect genetic machinery doesn't necessarily exist. I mean, there is some utility in it. It's, it would probably just be outweighed by its costs. Yes. So for example, um, in antibodies, our immune system is highly variable. The reason why we have so many innate defenses in our antibody stocks mm -hmm. are, there's lots of reasons why. But one of the primary reasons is that the, the genes that code for the parts of the antibodies, since it's uh, an RNA product basically with mm -hmm. some special bits attached, um, uh, there's 
there's a bot uh, there's a lot of variability in the way that you can attach the different parts together and there's a lot of variability on the specific active site on the variable region um, well no that's not the variable region are you talking about uh, an antibody production <laughs> the way that an antibody takes shape after it's produced um, by the genetic code we're talking about protein folding no kind oh. of it's yeah. RNA folding okay yeah it's a catalyst folding um, so the active site is very specific to a, a certain target, usually proteins. It can be a lot of other things, though. Mm -hmm. um, and the the way that it generates that active site is by a lot of randomness. Yeah. So like the the combination that goes into it yep. and the mistakes that are made mistakes are in, are inherent in the are, process. Yeah, and they. <sighs> In the first like run of these antibodies, it's very random what the active site actually is. So you have just like tons, tons and tons and tons of different possibilities the of like single method. and yeah, yeah, single and two copies in your bloodstream type antibodies. And like if and uh, it's actually more than that, but um, if this one antibody comes across that one specific antigen that it's meant for. And it, and it binds, and another cell binds it yeah. and amplifies that signal of the one that just so happened to be made to match that pathogen. And it amplifies, and then you've got like 20 in your bloodstream. Then one of those hits, and then you've got like 500 in your bloodstream, and then one of those hits, and you've got like thousands. It's that um, random generation in the active site that determines the fitness of the individual. That small process that's inherent in the creation of antibodies makes it extremely successful as a way of defending the body against pathogens. Mm -hmm. and, <sighs> and there's here, a lot of other stuff we, like that. And here in the we body. try and analyze something and try and create a uh, we we try and create uh, an antibiotic for it or whatever, and and we're I guess in, when we we're do way that, better at when it. We do that sort humans. of right, but when we do that sort of thing in the lab, you're just going going for that one, and then you're going to take hours and days and maybe months to actually make something that's the design that you want. Meanwhile, the body is just pulling the the slot machine lever a million times, yeah, and uh, it wins <laughs> more often than you do. And yeah. then when you do finally win, whatever you've created is this really cool, super awesome uh, antibiotic that is very quickly out uh, outpaced by the genetic variation in yep. in the bacteria that you're trying to kill off. Yep. There's lots of reasons why people try to strengthen the immune system more than they try to take antibiotics. Mm -hmm. There's it's more hippie movement stuff, but there's some good parts to it too. So I guess the important thing would be that your body eat healthy, has exercise yeah, more. Your body has the supply of the things it needs to do its job. Usually, that's the greatest, most important thing that I can ever think of. Is it's a resource problem. It's almost always a resource problem. Like when somebody ends up in a hospital. Uh, Any time that I've ever heard of it, unless it was something very chronic and terminal, it's always been something like, oh, they were really dehydrated, so we brought them to the ER. It's like, couldn't have given them a bottle of water like a few <laughs> hours earlier? Are you dumb? Or, uh, you know, something along those lines. Or, oh, geez, they were just exhausted. They were so stressed. And um, it, it just seems like these are easy fixes that are just rest eat food. No, no. You think that's food, because you're putting it in your mouth. No, <laughs> food. Food. Yeah. Um, so this is actually another None one. of that bleached flower shit. Oh, bleached <laughs> flower shit, yes. Um, speaking from a perspective of somebody who knows an awful lot of uh, bi biology, this one will irk you a little bit, too. Uh, I think I grabbed this one from Food Inc. or something like that. I'm 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 going with a lot of this high-minded 
uh, well-meaning um, sort of hipster mumbo-jumbo. You'll like this one, though. Okay. The concept is um, factory farms and factory farms, the cows are... Uh, you actually remember Ireland. I do. You remember the cows grazing. It's kind of sitting around... Getting in the there's way. <laughs> so much grass, there's nothing else to do but put a cow on it. Yeah. Or sheep. More sheep than cows, but yeah. But whatever, you put a cow there, it's going to make stuff. It's going to make your milk. It's you know, going to get your butter. You're going to be able to slaughter it and get beef. Now in America, we just have big factory farms for the most part, and we feed them corn. Why? Because corn is subsidized, and it's cheap as hell. Apparently feed them corn, they can't digest it. So that means that corn is bad. And corn, you know, when you feed them corn in a factory farm, they, they need all sorts of antibiotics. Yeah. So that means that corn is bad. Now I know you can obviously tell that these cause and effects are so poorly linked together already that it doesn't make a lot of sense. But from a biological standpoint, is there any reason to believe the notion that corn is uh, indigestible or somehow inherently harmful to the diet? Yes. Okay. Would you like specific sites? Yeah. Okay. Not specific sites. Just give me, give me, you know, the rundown. Like, how does this work? Is it in quantities? Is it at all? Are we just eating the wrong kind of thing? What's going on? Can cows digest corn? That would make good sense that they wouldn't necessarily be able to because that's not a thing they normally have digested. But I don't think that it necessarily has a bearing on humans. It we does. Are, uh, the way that it's integrated into their um, muscles will probably be different. Um, I think it has something to do... And it really should be specific. I understand that people are trying to be informational and useful when they say things like peroxide in your bread is going to give you cancer uh, or corn is going to give you cancer. But there's a lot to be said for assessing cause an effect rather than just correlation. Um, so anyways, I think he's finding the information pretty quickly. Yep. This is still about cows, though. So cattle, <laughs> cattle called corn-fed, grain-fed, or corn-finished are typically fattened on maize, soy, and other types of feed for several months before slaughter. As a high-starch, high-energy food, corn decreases the time to fatten cattle and increases yield from da dairy cattle. Some corn-feed cattle are fattened in concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. In the United States, most grass-fed cattle are raised for beef production. Dairy cattle may be supplemented with grain to increase the efficiency of production and reduce the area needed for support, or needed to support the energy requirements of the herd. A growing number of health and environmental proponents in the United States, such as the Union of Concerned Scientists, advocate raising cattle on pasture and other forage. Complete adoption of farming practices like grass-fed beef production systems would increase the amount of land needed to raise beef, but reduce land used to grow soy and corn to feed them which would help with our terrible... And here I thought when we were talking about culture. reducing uh, area, we were actually taking into account the corn. But apparently that means we weren't. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's a long story as far as like how much yeah. vegetable it takes to feed. Also uh, the fact cow. that I, I believe if I understand properly, corn uh, as a crop uh, takes an awful lot out of the soil. Oh, it takes so much out. Because it doesn't have... Usually farmers don't grow corn in anything but a monoculture. So it's just corn. Yep. There's no nitrogen fixing legumes beneath it. There's no alfalfa. There's no none. Because that's so it's more or less how we farm. How we farm in the past hundred years. 
there's been a lot of changes. That's a completely separate topic, topic uh, that I could talk about for a long time. But, um... We're looking at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and... I'm not sure I'm... Uh, So that oh. really talks oh. more oh, about... Oh, 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 here's a good source. Finally. Uh, this is North Dakota's NDSU Agriculture. Uh, it's a PDF, so I can trust it. <laughs> right. I'm kidding. And they paid um, for a logo, too. Look at that. High moisture corn. High in energy, but relatively low in protein compared to other grain feeds. For optimum dairy or dietary utilization, corn should be processed by rolling, cracking, or coarsely grinding prior to feeding the decision. To process corn should be based on efficiencies gained from processing compared to the cost of processing. So basically, that didn't say anything about well, the I guess potential uh, health we, we could answer it from an efficiency standpoint, and that is it doesn't make sense as an for the overall efficiency. Yeah, of but like feeding a society. Why feed it something we can eat when we can feed it something we can't eat, like grass? But, yeah. <laughs> Quit talking smart. <laughs> no, uh, that that's kind of what I've always gotten at. There's doesn't make sense to uh well, you said it right there. I can't I can't summarize it any better. There's there's a lot of other things that go into it too. I do remember talking to people that are NRM majors, uh natural natural resource management majors in my uh global sustainable agriculture class and in ecology. And they're saying there is a correlation with disease. No, there's or? a there's a causative agent in corn that um cattle are unable to process that's what about humans that's kind of what I was going towards I mean, people are likening the the cattle processing corn or not processing corn to well then humans obviously can't do it I'm thinking we're uh, we have different a little histories. bit we're, we're a little bit different in the digestive department <laughs> we have one stomach number one <laughs> um, there's a, there's that obvious difference uh, there's a lot of things about rumination that are really complicated. I th I'm pretty sure that corn somehow disrupts the natural uh, ruminant colonies. Yeah. It basically not unlike when uh, we have poor dietary uh, uh, poor dietary habits in people. And we Imagine have drinking a lot of coffee yes. in like two days, and yes. you have diarrhea for the next four days. Yeah. Try feeding corn only to a cattle uh, or to a cow. I, I get what, what you're saying, and it was kind of what I was going for, where we need to recolonize bacteria, which is a a thing that we do now, apparently, and uh, it's, it's... It's called repopulate. You know, for real. I think <laughs> that's actually not a bad idea, so alongside the Mountain Dew and the pizza rolls, you should also have, you know, uh, you know the shit shot. That'd be great, you know, just... Just ate up all that stuff that there's no way your body's going to do anything with it. And uh, it's so well preserved that now you are too. <laughs> and well, you've just starved a bunch of uh, a bunch of otherwise useful gut bacteria, aren't you proud? You can replace that. You just got to take a swig of this. Yeah, probiotics are nice. Well, there is that. <laughs> That's the slight, the slightly more uh, more palatable way of doing this. Yeah, instead of a glass of poop. <laughs> yes. Uh, they do actually have fecal transplants yep. available that are yep. artificial, and um, they also have some that are not artificial. Yeah. Um, but it is really helpful for people with certain diseases. I think it helps with Crohn's disease or something. I was going to actually suggest uh, with Crohn's specifically, and it amazes me that I haven't heard of more people having that as a treatment for Crohn's. Because it's I a, it's know a relatively modern development. There was a recent uh, study that they did 
on the effectiveness of fecal transplants, and they had to stop it because it was so effective that it was unethical to continue giving no treatment to the controls. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, because it's undue suffering to so I would the disease with um, I would then uh, state that I and I believe what was interesting to me when I moved actually uh, to the area was that there seemed to be a bizarre number of people that I met that had Crohn's or Where'd new you move? people with Crohn's uh, to this Holland? to this area to the Grand Rapids area. Okay. Um, and I had never encountered it at all previously, and I thought the obvious is there's something in the water and really by that I mean is there something <laughs> in the fish is there s no is there something more in in just the local environment or maybe the habits the common habits of those people and these people could not be further apart than you could imagine and I still have not uh, found a link uh, between those aside from one of them if I remember properly was in some sort of argument with uh, with a previous roommate about uh, that person. One, one of the people being um, somehow harmful to another person and uh, uh, to, I believe, is a family member. It's one of these sort of... Um, the, the, the long story short is that they were putting bleach into something that they were giving this person and this person was getting worse and worse. And so to kind of uh, put them in their place they consumed the thing that had bleach in it to, you know, show how they would otherwise be harming somebody else. It's a really screwed up situation. Anyways, long story short, that person shortly ended up with Crohn's after that. So, that's one way to Drink kill off... bleach. That's one way to kill off bacteria. That is one way to kill off bacteria. <laughs> that is one way to do all sorts of horrible things to yourself. Yeah. Um, but... The other one has th there's no similar connection there, and obviously that's a very strong outlier. Uh, yeah, just not something that's common. Um, but the most whole food, healthiest eater you can imagine. Oh God. Really, and you would not think that this would happen, but this happened at actually a very uh, very adolescent age. It's um, possible that they had some sort of like dirt or something that had uh, sure really harmful bacterium that outcompeted their local flora, and, and then as a result, then they went on antibiotics and da 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 or what whatever. Yeah, that's actually not a not a bad thought um, because many uh, a lot of times I mean th that's one of the upshots from this whole factory food movement is it's treated fairly well. But, I mean, most of the time when we do see um, foodborne uh, illnesses from uh, produce, well, first of all, we don't hear about it in frozen foods. Yeah. Second of all, we don't normally hear about it in processed foods, but we do hear about it in lots of fresh foods. Yeah. And that's just because you want to keep you something food. at a temperature that is uh, wonderful for breeding bacteria, and you want to try and transport it a very long distance nowadays anyways. And you're, it's a very difficult proposition without culturing something. Um, not to say that it's bad to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, it's just it's the nature of the business if you're going oh. to eat tomatoes that you got from, you know, Guatemala and they had to be shipped thousand miles to you. Well, it takes a while to do that and it goes through a lot of hands and people moving it. Yeah. It just happens. But if you were able to, yes, have something out of your backyard, uh, even if the neighbor's dog craps in the backyard, you're probably good. As long as you wash it. And yeah. if there's like a small amount of soil on your plant and you eating it can be really bad for you. Can be. Mm -hmm. A little dirt never hurt, in my opinion, but... Not good for the teeth, either. <sighs> it's... It's it's complicated. It's risky. Yep. But um, oh, let's see other biology topics. I mean, I've covered a, a ton of food-related things. You have. I it's really things that I've been kind of fascinated with for a while. Mm -hmm. And then you brought up the uh, concept of histone uh, storage or histone, histone memory coding. or coding. I, I'm using my own terms for it, <laughs> but. Uh, 
that's that's um, very fascinating stuff. It is. Um, and I'm only just now beginning to understand mm -hmm. it because I don't get to read that level of papers very often because it's, it's really mm -hmm. uh, not mainstream. I'll, I'll leave you with um, a question that I thought was uh, enraging. And we touched on one part of it earlier when we were talking about the uh, the appearance of Bill Nye on uh, an, an NBC uh, chat show. And hey there. Um, I liked this particular one because it came up very late in the conversation. There was, if I remember properly, it was a senator and uh, and and Bill talking about they were, the topic was supposed to be the economy of global warming. I know, and you're thinking this is this is once again so far out there. This isn't really a biology question. Um, it is it is to an extent. Um, so. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you to approach it almost from a devil's advocate standpoint because that's kind of where I'm <laughs> placing you in this. Uh, the senator, uh, as a preface to this, uh, uh, Bill Nye was uh, asked, well, geez, uh, what is going to be the economic cost of, uh, of global warming? And of not essentially global warming? Yes. Global warming. And, and essentially, it's not, it's not truly quantifiable in, in raw terms. We can come up with all sorts of estimates, but we can't you know, put a price tag directly on it, but it's stupid, first of all, it, it's happening. It's uh, stupid to just, you know, bury your head in the sand and do nothing about it. Uh, it's going to affect all sorts of things negatively, already has affected uh, many things negatively, it could be argued, um, but predictably is going to have some very high costs. And um, the, uh, the senator replied at one point uh, that um, there may be really positive agricultural benefits from higher carbon. <laughs> That's true. There are actually some so positive agricultural benefits. The uh, the devil's advocate standpoint is that global warming will simply even itself out with <laughs> higher. Oh, oh, don't don't laugh so much yet. Uh, will simply even itself out with uh, greater plant growth, and that plant growth will equal sequestration of carbon in in the uh, in uh, in a biological uh, and a standard biological method. That's so true. Basically, higher trees, uh, more shrubs, more algal blooms, because those are good for everything. No. Um, no, it is it is true. Eventually, yes, the earth will come to homeostasis more or less. Yeah to use a biological term. I like Equilibrium because I like the movie where they point the guns at each other and they're doing this karate stuff. <laughs> but, sure, homeostasis. I, it's a term used within organisms. Which so defines like essentially a uh, balancing point. More or less. Equilibrium. Yeah. Yep. Um, eventually. Mm -hmm. And that'll be a part of what causes that to happen. Yep. Um but that's that's but not going to But along the way, we're going to get seriously, brutally messed up. No, I mean, we'll have more food, and it'll all be free. <laughs> so I am trying I know, to just I know make you this are. as difficult to answer as possible. I know you are, but as far as like our diverse food sources go, uh, we're going to lose a lot of species as sea levels change. Not the tasty ones, right? And as pH of the oceans change, and as... Um, oh, I, I'm, I completely forgot change. about it, yeah. Obviously, uh, what's the, uh, what is the, the chemical... Carbonic uh, acid. I was going to say, yep. which is, has carbon in it, sounds like it anyways. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, which is derived from what, CO2. precisely? And? Water. And what, energy, just basically sunlight? I think well, I, mean, I can't. Remember. Well, there's there is a catalyst that's common, but isn't it I don't related remember. in some fashion to to acid rain? Uh, that's sulfuric acid and uh, H2SO4. Okay. From SO. But stuff. nonetheless, carbonic SOS. acid is that thing that is eating away shellfish in the Pacific. I'm mm. talking about. You know, you're familiar with what I'm, with what I'm talking about. The uh, where they're going with the uh, the studies over decades about the thicknesses of shells of certain kinds of uh, shellfish. I wouldn't say that it's explicitly the carbonic acid, but changing pHs would 
contribute to that issue. Mm -hmm. Because it's a highly reactive thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the deposition of uh, calcium onto a shell is a really complicated process, mm -hmm. and it is dependent on ion concentrations around... So Whatever you change the pH level, it. and you essentially make it that you're much harder for the bonding. You're changing ion concentrations, period. Yeah. Uh, so if they're specifically apt adapted to a specific pH and specific ion concentration... Well, they just have to move then. That's what's happening, and they're moving, and they're dying. <laughs> by, by moving, we don't mean they're literally getting up and walking <laughs> away. It's more or less they're dying, and the ones that are different lat uh, uh, latitude are then surviving and breeding in greater yeah. numbers. But this isn't... A cut and dry and easy thing. Yeah, it's a very fluid process of change. Uh, fairly there's quick. a lot of it's it's basically putting an extremely large selective pressure. Selective pressure. Yeah. <sighs> Evolution terms. Um on a lot of different species all around the world. If anything, I think talking about this makes me realize how easy it is to say, well, we've only warmed up by point whatever degrees. That sounds le far less significant than any of the troubles that you talk about that are related to the uh, the change in, in carbon concentrations. And uh, yeah, going from yeah. 300 to 400 parts per million, it's just it's not much. Yeah, the sea it's level rising uh, two millimeters. Nothing. Oh, no big deal. No, it's really not. It's a big deal. It is. <laughs> um, yep. Especially in zones where those two millimeters make a, a big difference. I believe my boss was describing what we're going through right now as Snowpocalypse uh, 7 of 2014. So uh, Extreme weather isn't necessarily no. caused by global climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, but climate's definitely doing some weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I do believe that having more thermal energy in a local system contributes to more extreme wind events. That, I think, has a, a bit of causal evidence to it. Yep. Weather's really hard to really pin down causal effects, though, because mm -hmm. it's such a complicated but system. It's, uh, I would say the, the far more harmful thing is like, just the direct concentrations of carbon because you can point those directly to uh, carbon-related differences in the environment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Yep, so global warming bad. This is more of a chemistry discussion it and more of a bioethics out. discussion than I had planned on. That's life. It's the way it usually goes. Like, if, if you had asked about, oh, how is it we experience orgasm. I could go into like a really complicated discussion of like the body processes and all these things, but more or less it comes down to biochemistry and bioethics mm -hmm. and and those fields mm -hmm. when we talk about anything else other than like ourselves. Mm -hmm. See, so we talked about a utility in death, which is... <laughs> no. That was what you got out of it. Uh. Well, among other things, we talked about it. <laughs> I am, I am trying for to for all our suicidal audience members out there. I'm trying to summarize <laughs> with the uh, with the list of things that you might have missed that are kind of interesting. Um, yeah, a variety of other things. I can't even remember all of them at the moment right now. We talked about a lot, mm -hmm. as we do. Yeah, an hour and eighteen thirty. I think we're good. We should post this on YouTube if it lets us. <laughs> you mean by stop recording and save? Yes. Sure. Okay. Maybe see you some other time. Hopefully another week. This gets 